Welcome to Elevating Early Childhood. I'm Vanessa Levin, your host, and I help teachers of preschool and pre-K teach better, save time, and live more. And today's episode is all about flannel boards. Now, I've worked with many teachers over the years, and one thing I noticed that a lot of classrooms today are missing is a flannel board. So I went ahead and asked some of these teachers why. So the number one answer I got to why teachers aren't using flannel boards is my kids destroyed the pieces and or the flannel board. The second most popular answer I received was my kids just don't like going there. The third answer I got was, I have no idea what that thing is even for. Answer number four was, I thought that was old school, so I put it in the closet. And last but not least is, I don't have any space for that thing in my classroom. So I'm here to set the record straight about flannel boards in the early childhood classroom. So first things first, what is a flannel board? So traditionally, they used to be made of black flannel, and they were on a small, portable, lightweight board, sometimes propped up by a little stand that was plastic. And those stands usually became broken or lost within the first few weeks of use. So they usually were just kind of flopping around the classroom. Um, these days, you can see right here, I have this type of a flannel board. This particular one is from Lakeshore, and and it is made of a different type of a material. I don't know exactly what this material is. It's like flannel, but it's a lot more sturdy. It can take a lot more abuse and heavy use than the old school black flannel boards, which became fuzzy after a short period of use. And so you had to keep scraping them or shaving them with a sweater shaver. I don't know what that was about. But this one here, I really like and highly recommend. And you can see that it is actually magnetic. If I peel it back here, there's a giant magnet on the back and then it sticks to a magnetic surface. And so what I have it on today is an oil drip pan from your auto parts store. And so these oil drip pans are something that I use a lot in my classroom to create magnetic surfaces on my walls. And this is one I had left over from a project from a few years ago. It's a medium size one, although it looks huge here in the video. And um, I just have it propped up on my big book stand. So I have a professional big book stand, like the kind you would have in a regular classroom. And I actually use this one in my classroom. And and I have the oil drip pan set up on the big book stand. It's just propped up where the book would usually go, where the big book would usually go. And then I put this magnetic flannel board on there. And there are lots and lots of different ways that you can get or find flannel boards. Lakeshore makes a number of them. Sometimes there's even pieces of furniture, almost like an easel. One side is a whiteboard, one side is a flannel board. Um, there's lots of different types out there in the different teacher catalogs. I like this one because my oil drip pan is portable. I can secure it to the wall if I want to. And I have a number of those in my uh, classroom, but for purposes of this video, this was just what worked best for me. So let's cut to the chase now. What is the purpose of a flannel board? Okay, and the purpose of a flannel board is to support retelling skills. Now you can use it for other things. You could certainly use it for math if you were counting different flannel pieces on here and that type of a thing. But generally speaking, the flannel board is used to support oral language, and retelling of stories. And there are a number of different ways that you can do that. And I'm going to demonstrate how to do that in just a minute. So let's get down to the nitty gritty. What standards can you support using a flannel board? That's right. There are standards out there. Now, whether you're using your state standards, your program standards, or national standards like the Common Core, 
all early learning standards include some form of storytelling. And so I've pulled a few for you here from a couple of different state websites. And the good thing about standards is that these standards actually have the age groups. So this isn't just for two-year-olds or three-year-olds or four-year-olds or five-year-olds. I found standards for every age group that you can teach using a flannel board. So first up, we have um, talks about events and characters in storybooks in ways that suggest understanding of the story. And that's 20 months to 26 months. So this is actually a standard in a state talking about the retelling of stories, right? It says characters and events in storybooks. And that is absolutely something you can do with a flannel board with children as young as 20 months. Next one I found was enjoys nursery rhymes. So this is a common thread throughout many, many different states' early childhood standards. But enjoys nursery rhymes 18 to 30 months, right? This is across many different states. And good teaching is good teaching. So you're going to see standards repeated in all the various states. It's not like the children in Maryland can learn retelling, but the children in Virginia can't. You know what I mean? Children are children no matter where you live in the United States. So we see retelling in all of the early learning standards across the board. It's just the way they refer to them and the different age groups they have called out for certain types of, of retelling. Um, the next one is recites simple stories from familiar picture books. Can we do that with a flannel board? You betcha. And that one is for ages 24 months to 36 months. So children as young as two can be reciting simple stories from familiar books. And I'm going to demonstrate how to do that, um, that particular standard in just a minute. The next one is independently says parts of rhymes. Now you may have guessed here on the flannel board, I have a wall. We see a wall here and this is a nursery rhyme. So I think you can pretty much infer that we're going to talk about Humpty Dumpty in just a minute, but independently says parts of a rhyme. So many of my four-year-old students in pre-K could recite Humpty Dumpty from heart, but we're talking here in this particular standard, um, 30 to 36 months, they can do that. They can recite parts of a rhyme. Um, retells familiar stories. Now, for those of you who teach pre-K four-year-olds through five-year-olds, so, so this standard specifically states, retells familiar stories. Just flat out retells familiar stories. That's in almost all the state standards that I've looked at, right? And I've looked at all the states, if they have them. Not all states have early learning standards. Can you believe it? And Retail Familiar Stories is a common one for children ages four to five, even in the Common Core. The next one is retells a story in their own words, right? That's a tough one. So they're doing it independently without you. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute and how you can make a flannel board a center in your classroom. Yes, you can do it. <laughs> And the next one is also for children ages four to five. And this one says uses complex sentences when retelling familiar stories. And that's also ages four to five complex sentences, because those are the types of sentences we find in picture books that we read to children. They usually have a more complex sentence structure than just conversing with each other in peer-to-peer -peer conversations, right? And the last one is perhaps my favorite, and that is reenacts a favorite story with puppets, props, or felt board characters. Yes, they actually said felt board in this standard. And again, that's for ages four to five. So do you see how we can progress from very, very young children gaining lots of skills from a flannel board all the way up to the highest end of pre-K, uh, preschool, which is pre-K ages four to five. So a flannel board can support 
all of these and more because you could be doing um, literacy activities with your flannel. You can do a lot of things with your flannel board, right? You could do math, literacy, but retelling is the most common one. And it's an easy way to support the development of retelling skills. And it's also a different method, right? We can do that using books, of course, picture books that we read aloud, but storytelling is another layer of that onion, right? So that brings us to the part of this episode where we are going to do a small demo. So if you're wondering, how do I do a flannel board with my kids? Do I just let them have at it at the flannel board? Do I just put it up on the wall in my classroom or put it out in the center and let them have at it? And the answer to that is a resounding no, of course not. So one of the ways So one of the ways that I do that is I always start with a book first. So I don't have the best read aloud for you right now because I'm going to do a whole other episode about how to read a big book and how to use a pocket chart. Those are two things you could also incorporate into this type of a lesson. So I'm just going to use a very simple Humpty Dumpty book. So I would start by reading the book aloud to my kids. We're going to pretend that this is probably the second or third day that we have been listening to this rhyme in our classroom. So our students are familiar with me reading the story. Now, it's very, very brief because Humpty Dumpty is not that long of a rhyme, right? Uh, And I would use a much larger book um, because... My kids would be in person with me, but on the screen, this one fits perfectly. And of course I would do the introduction as the title, the author, the illustrator, and all of that good stuff. That's not what this episode is about. So I'm gonna skip all that. So um, let's say I have the book with me and I'm gonna start my little mini flannel board lesson with asking them to tell me what the story is about. If they remember, do you remember what Humpty Dumpty was doing in this story? Yes, that's right. He sat on the wall. It would be helpful if I was on the right page. That's right. He sat on the wall. He's sitting on the wall. Can you help me tell the story? Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. That's right. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Do you see how I um, skipped the last word and let them fill it in? That's how you know this is a second or third telling of the story because they wouldn't know that on the first try unless they were already familiar with the rhyme from being at home. So I let my voice fall out and they filled it in. And this is actually a standard in the state of Texas on the early learning guidelines. It actually says the children will fill in the blank at the end of sentences. So you're hitting all kinds of great stuff with this. So back to our lesson, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. There he is. What's going to happen next? Oh, that's right. You remembered. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. Oh my goodness. Look at that. This word here in the top bubble says, ouch. (laughs) I would certainly say, ouch, if that was me. Now what happens? Oh, that's, yeah, there's something about horses in there, I think. Let's see. All the king's horses and all the king's men, all the king's horses and all the king's men, they came. What did they decide? Are they going to fix it? Well, that's right. They couldn't put Humpty together again. That's right. They couldn't put him together again. Oh, my goodness. That's right. Yes, you remembered the story of Humpty Dumpty. Don't forget, if you want to read this book, I'll put it right over here in the classroom library in this basket. And that's referring to the podcast episode that I did all about how to use your classroom library. So if you haven't listened to that one, go back and listen to it now. Okay, so now I'm gonna move into the flannel board portion. So now I've kind of activated their prior knowledge, right? Because we're familiar with the story or the rhyme of Humpty Dumpty. I read them the little story. It was very short and quick. I, I stretched it out way too long because I was talking to you while I was doing it. And so now I would call their attention to the flannel board. We're gonna pretend this is the first time they have seen me use the flannel board. So I'm gonna say, oh, what do I have 
here. <gasps> I see it. Yes. What is this? That's the, oh, you are so smart. That's the wall. <gasps> oh my. So where is, <gasps> there he is. What's he doing? Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. That's right. And now what's going to happen? Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. Oh, no. Yes, that's look, he, he's broken. All the king's horses and all the king's men. They could not put Humpty to gather again. And so one thing I like to do that doesn't have anything to do with the flannel board is I like to use hand motions for my dual language learners. So when it says horses, all the king's horses, I do like I'm riding a horse and holding the reins, all the king's horses and all the king's men. And I do the walking with my fingers like this. And then couldn't put Humpty together again. I take my two hands and I interlace my fingers as if I was putting them together. They couldn't put Humpty together again. And I shake my head no. And so those are visuals that really help my dual language learners. So do you see how quick that was? I put the flannel board characters up there really quickly. And now we're retelling the story with the flannel board characters. Now I might try it again and I might pass out the pieces to a few children. So I have four pieces here. Actually, I have more men for the king's men so I can have more kids. So let's see. Um, one, two, three, four, five pieces so I can have five children interact. So I would pass the pieces out. And I would say, oh, I'm going to give Humpty Dumpty to Tristan. Tristan, you have Humpty Dumpty in the beginning of the story. And Jessica's going to get Humpty Dumpty when he falls down. And I have three of the king's men. One has a horse. So I'm going to give all the king's horses to Malia. And I have two men here. I'm going to give one to Patricia. And one to, I have to think of another child's name, Jason. <laughs> and then we're going to retell it again. And I'm going to invite those children to come up and place the pieces on the wall. And if you run out of time at that point, you can say, oh my goodness, now we know the story of Humpty Dumpty. And tomorrow I'll pass out the pieces to five other children or whatever. Six, I think I ended up with. Um, or you could do it again and let five different children have a chance. It depends on how much time you have. And I'm not going to put this out in the center just yet. They're not ready for that. <laughs> so sometimes I don't put a flannel board out in my centers until late October, November, sometimes even December. It really depends on the children in my classroom, how old they are. If I was in a three-year-old classroom, I would never put the flannel board out all by itself um, because it's just not something they'd be able to do independently. And referring back to those standards that we read, um, the actual use of the flannel board itself doesn't come into play in those standards until ages four and five. Now, another thing to think about is these flannel characters, I'm sure somebody will ask, these flannel characters are very, very sturdy. Not all flannel boards were created equally, just like not all flannel board pieces were created equally. And these come from a company called Little Folk, F-O-L-K, Little Folk Visuals. And here's a fun story. Way, 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 way back in the day when dinosaurs roamed the earth, Little folk visuals used to be sold by representatives. Like they would come to the school and you would place your little folk orders. I don't know if it was considered an MLM or what. I'm not really sure, but I remember placing a little folk order um, on my campus from the little folk rep. And that was super exciting. But then Amazon came around and they started offering them on Amazon. And that's where I got all of mine. Here's the pro tip. Order them pre-cut. 
Because if you don't, they come on one giant flannel sheet and you will get carpal tunnel cutting them all out with scissors. And your scissors will die because flannel is very difficult to cut. So save yourself um, the extra effort and time that it takes to cut all them out and just spend that little bit extra to get the pre-cut ones. And if your school district buys these for you, if, you're, if your school or campus does, then that is awesome. I highly recommend the nursery rhyme and the fairy tale sets. Those are my favorites, but I do have a bunch of others. I have like five little monkeys jumping on the bed and I have a whole bunch of other ones. I have an entire like Sterilite 30 gallon tub filled with flannel board stories. These are very, very sturdy. That's something that I get asked quite often is don't they just crinkle them up and they get dirty and gross. And these are, these last a long time. I use these specific ones in my own public school classroom for many years. In fact, the children who were in my class when I bought these, and I know this because one of the moms helped me cut these out. Those children are now adults with their own children. That's how old these are. So I use these for many years in my classroom and they're still going strong. And I used them in this way. And you can see um, how my cutting skills, I didn't, I, by the time I got to this portion of cutting them out, uh, my hand was tired. And so I, I kind of cheated. And here's, here's even some of the writing left here on the side because I ran out of, of cutting power in my hands. So, so those are little folk visuals. I highly recommend if you're watching along with us on YouTube, I will put a link in the show notes for you. And if you're listening, um, then go to prekpages.com and type flannel board into the search box that will take you to this podcast episode. And all the links are in the bottom of each of our podcast episode posts on the blog. So when it comes to using a flannel board as a learning center in your classroom, as an independent learning center with your students who are ages four to five, I've got tips for you to make it work. So that way you don't have to worry about them destroying things or not being engaged or on task at the flannel board center. You have to set your kids up for success with this center. And so first things first, you're going to do the I do, we do together, you do a method, right? And so you saw me do the I do. I did it in front of them, right? That's after I read the story, I did the flannel board. Then we did we do, that's when I gave them the pieces and I was here to support and scaffold for them, right? And they came and put the pieces on the board. So we did it together. And then the you do means you do it independently. Now, after I did that one lesson using the flannel board, I would not put this out for centers yet. <laughs> I'm gonna do this many times with my class before this this particular flannel board story goes into my flannel board center. So many times we have to know exactly how the whole thing works. And I will usually, in the case of nursery rhymes, read that book every single time that I do it because the picture cues are going to be um, helpful as prompts for my students. And I can get in some literacy, some concepts of print by pointing to the words. We can talk about author, illustrator, title, front of the book, and all of that great concept of print stuff that's in all early learning standards across all the different states. Um, so I'm still going to do that because it's very short and quick. Now, if it was a story like Goldilocks and the Three Bears or any of the other fairy tales, I probably wouldn't read the story every single time um, because then it would take too long. But for the short little nursery rhymes, there's no harm in doing that. Okay, so now that you know that we're going to do the I do, we do, you do method several times before you ever put it out, next comes the it's time to put it out in a center. How do you make it so they don't just mess all the pieces up, um, trample on them, step on them, tear them up, and all that good stuff? So some of the things that I did to set my kids up for success at the flannel board center was I didn't put this center out until I had done at least two cycles of two different nursery rhymes with them. So let's say I did Humpty Dumpty sometime in October. I don't know. And then I did Humpty Dumpty for about 
a week or two weeks at least with my kids. And I went on and I did another one. Let's say I did Hickory Dickory Dock. When I was finished with both of those rhymes, introducing to my student, those to my students over a period of several weeks, then and only then would I put out my flannel board center and I would put all the characters from Humpty Dumpty in one zip top bag. And now for my flannel board center, I really liked to have these in some kind of a plastic zip top bag, but I also use the ones with the little hook on the top, you know, that the students often take home books in. So they're like picture book storage bags or whatever. Um, I would put them in there and then I had in my classroom, one of those um, from Lakeshore, one of those easels. And on one side was flannel and the other side was a magnetic whiteboard. And in between those two pieces, there was those bars, right? Because it would fold up, supposedly. I never liked the bars because the kids would pinch their fingers in them, but um, they came in handy for hanging those two bags on. So my students would have two choices at the flannel board, Humpty Dumpty, or Hickory Dickory Dock. Those are the two that we've done so far. I would put each set in one of those bags and I would hang the bags on that brace in between um, the flannel boards. Now, there are a lot of other ways to do that, um, but I like to give them a choice when they go there so they can choose which rhyme to do. And because the rhymes are so quick, they would only be at that center for just a minute or two if they just had one of those short little rhymes. Now, if I was doing uh, a fairy tale, right, like I was doing Goldilocks and the Three Bears, I might just have that one out because that one has a lot more pieces. The story is much more longer and complex, and I don't have to worry about them being engaged as long because the, the story is too short, which it's not. So that's one way I like to do it. The next thing that I always do and I always make sure that I do is have a book in that bag along with the flannel board pieces. So this book actually was in the bag with these pieces. This is a small little book. It's a um, nursery rhyme reader from Scholastic. And they have a whole set of these. I don't know if they still sell them. I got this one a few years ago, but they have sets of them and they are perfect in my opinion for putting in the bag with your flannel pieces. So I put the book in the bag with the pieces because asking your students to recall, your students who are four and five, to recall the story from memory without the book as a support is a completely different skill than offering them the book for support. So I like to put the book in there and I show them, I demonstrate with them how they take the pieces out of the bag and they put the book on the floor or wherever their flannel board is located. And they open the book, they look at the pictures and then they retell the story by putting the pieces on the flannel board. So they're using the book as a support, right? As they go. When I started using the books as support along with my flannel board pieces and my flannel board center engagement skyrocketed. So having that book is super important, especially as your stories get more complex. So if I was doing Goldilocks and the Three Bears, you betcha, I probably wanna have that book in the bag with the pieces so they can use it as a support, right? So the gingerbread man, that's one um, that I remember. And the order of, of in which the animals appear in the story is always tricky for kids, right? Um, so having that picture book for support at that time is super helpful for your kids. So be sure to have a book for support with your flannel board pieces. So some other ways that I have used flannel boards, because I didn't always have that um, triangular easel in my classroom. I was in many different classrooms over the years. And um, some years I didn't have a flannel board at all, depending on what campus I was on or whether I was the new teacher on campus. Um, so um, one of the things that I have done with great success is to use pizza boxes for very small individual flannel boards. So if you go to your local pizza shop that uses card board boxes and you're very, very kind to them and you ask very, very nicely if they would donate some pizza boxes to your early childhood classroom because you want to make flannel boards for the kids, they just might do it. And you just take some black flannel, felt, whatever you want to call it, 
you cut it, glue it to the front. I glued mine to the front of the pizza boxes with hot glue. And then when you open the pizza box up, you put the pieces and the book inside. And then I made little labels to go on the end of each pizza box with the title, right? And I stacked them up on the shelf and I put them in my, at that time, in my puzzle center because they stacked up so nicely next to my puzzles, but you can put them wherever you want. And then I had about three, maybe four at the most of those pizza boxes out. And they were really fairly individualized because they were smaller. Um, although I did sometimes have two kids playing with them. You have to be careful though, because some of the pieces uh, of the flannel board set you have might be bigger than the front of the box. So think about that. So I just hot glued that flannel on the front of the pizza box and stored everything else inside, stacked them up nicely on a shelf, worked really well. And of course, you can always be like me and use an oil drip pan that you have on your wall or any kind of magnetic surface and stick one of these um, flannel boards from Lakeshore on there, these magnetic flannel boards, which I love. So here's some troubleshooting tips for you. So just in case you've followed all of my tips so far and your kids are still struggling with how to use the flannel board at Learning Center time independently, here's a few tricks you can try. So first things first, if your kids are showing you that they don't understand how something works, that's information that you can take and use to think about what you can do differently. So obviously they need to have the rules or the routine of how to use the flannel board independently reintroduced. And so we need to take a step back and we need to say, okay, I need to do that again because they don't get it. And that's normal for little kids, right? We can't just tell them how to use the flannel board once and then walk away and dust their hands off and call it a day. They're going to need a lot of support and reinforcement. So that's one thing that you can try. So if, if they made a mess of it and it was a complete disaster in your centers, take it back up and go through the whole process again of introducing it to them and showing them how to use it. Make sure that you have a book in there for retelling purposes. And even if you have a book in there, and they're still tearing things up, think about, are they using the book? So you're going to want to observe and see, are they using the book to support the retelling? So tip number three is don't overwhelm your kids. So if you've put out two sets, like you've got the Humpty Dumpty and the Hickory Dickory Doc out at your independent flannel board center and things aren't going well, take a step back after you've looked at the first two troubleshooting tips. Perhaps your kids are being overwhelmed. So Take one of those sets out if that's the case. And maybe your kids do better with just one set. It really depends on your class and how much time and effort you put in up front to make the center work for your kids. You also might consider spending a little time over there during one day during center time where you're interacting with kids who come over and play with the flannel board just to be there to support and scaffold for success. So I know, I know, you're probably wondering where in the world you can put this flannel board in your classroom because some of you have very little space and that's okay. Um, one of the things I've already talked about that's a great space saver is using those pizza boxes. So one year I walked into a classroom where there were there's absolutely nothing in the room except four walls, 22 chairs, a teacher's desk, and a filing cabinet. And that's the year that I started using um, pizza boxes as flannel boards. So if you're short on space, that's one idea. Another idea where you're short on space is to use one of these magnetic things attached to your wall. This is an oil drip pan from the auto parts store. So if you have a wall or the back of a cabinet or something um, where you're able to attach something like this, this is a great space saver so that it doesn't take up any room on the floor. It doesn't take up a lot of space in the room. And, and the great thing about flannel boards is they're vertical, right? So you don't have to have a lot of space to have them in your classroom. And that brings us to where in your learning center scheme of things, do you put the flannel board? So do you have to have a flannel board center? And the answer would be no. Um, you can put this in your classroom library because it technically is retelling, right? Which goes along with books and reading and literacy. And so having it in your classroom library center is great. Um, you could have it in a general literacy center 
that works too. Um, in my last public school classroom that I had, I had a classroom library. And on the end of the bookcase that I had, the book storage area, um, I had that triangular easel that we talked about that had flannel on one side, whiteboard on the other. And I stuck that at the end of that, um, that shelf. And that was just part of our library center, that magnet or that um, flannel board on one side was just part of our library center. And the kids knew that. And I had a book in each of the flannel board bags. So it just made perfect sense to do that. So you could put it in your classroom library. Um, you could have a standalone storytelling center if you just need another center. I did limit the storytelling center to just two children because um, in my case, it was a vertical easel and it really only had room for two children to stand around it. When three children tried to go there, there just wasn't enough space and they were just jostling each other and getting all over each each other's space. And it was just very, very awkward to have three children there. So I did limit that particular center to just two children because they had a hard time using the flannel board if I didn't. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, I've also located it near um, my safe space or my quiet area, whatever you want, whatever you call that in your classroom, your calm down area. I've also located it near there um, just because it is, it is great to have something as a end cap, if you will. If you were in the grocery store, you know, there's an end cap at the end. I kind of used it as an end cap at one point. Um, and I had like a, a bin underneath that stored some of my, um, safe area things inside of it. It really depends on, on you, your classroom size, your setup of your classroom, um, but putting it in an, a literacy area just makes a lot of sense because it is a literacy skill that you are reinforcing. So I hope that you got some stellar flannel board ideas that you can take back and use in your classroom right away to make the retelling or flannel board center in your classroom be as successful as it can be. And if you need any more support or maybe links to things I talked about, don't forget if you're listening along, um, go to pre-K pages and type flannel board in the search box. That's prekpages.com. And then also if you're watching on YouTube, we will have a link in the show notes to where you can find some of these things I talked about as well as the blog post on pre-K pages. So until next time, I'm Vanessa Levin. Onward and upward.